So today we'll begin uh, with uh, chapter 11 by reading verse 22 through 24. Then what I'll do, as I normally do, is I'll bring you up to speed by sharing a few things, giving you some context and all. And then we're going to move into our, our study today. So let's begin reading here in, uh, in Acts chapter 11 at verse 22. I'll read to verse 24, again, give you an introduction and move into our study. Then news of these, these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So as we've seen, and again, I'm giving you an introduction, laying that foundation, persecution has hit the church. It had arisen over a man by the name of Stephen. As we've gone through Acts, we've seen that Stephen was one of the men who had been given ministry authority, and that was because there had been a division caused of the neglect of the what are called the Hellenistic widows. The Hellenists were, were Jews who spoke Greek and had Greek culture, and there was a division over that. What had happened is they had taken this problem to the apostles, and the apostles felt the responsibility to do something to resolve it. So they pointed out first that these kinds of issues were what we today would refer to as ministry distractions. They had said in Acts chapter 6, verse 2, it's not desirable, it's not acceptable, it's not proper that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Now, when they said that it's not proper or acceptable, it's not desirable to leave the Word of God and serve tables, it wasn't because such ministry was beneath them. They knew there were servants who were following the greatest servant. It was because their main job was to remain continually in prayer and, and the Word. So they had a greater priority, if you will, and they needed to concentrate on that. So this was a distraction. It's reminiscent of the time when the great leader Moses had become distracted. His father-in-law, Moses' father-in-law, saw that Moses would actually uh, sit as the judge over the people, and, and he would do that from morning until evening, and he was judging over their concerns. After seeing this, his father-in-law Jethro asked him, what, what are you doing and why are you doing that? Well, Moses said, well, the people come to seek God's will and I have to decide that for them. Jethro said, this isn't good because both you and the people are going to tire out. You're going to burn out. So he said, this is what you should be doing. It's found in Exodus 18, 20 through 23. Jethro said, teach them God's, his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you'll be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. So he said, this isn't a good thing. You need to remember what your primary responsibility is, Moses. It's to teach them his decrees and to show them the way to live and how they're to behave. This is what your job is. That is the job of the leader. That is something that was brought into the church during the church age, is there needs to be a leader who, who teaches God's word and, and lives God's word so that they see it evidence before them. But in order to do all the work, there needs to be a team. There needs to be others. And that's what took place here. And that's what we saw in the, in the book of Acts when this problem had arisen, how, how the men, the apostles had said, it isn't right that we should leave uh, the word of God and, and, and wait on tables. And so select from among yourselves these kinds of men. And so that was the problem that had produced the first deacons. And Stephen was one of the first deacons in the church. He was a man, Scripture says, filled with faith and power, and he performed wonders and he performed signs. Because of this, his opponents had 
tried to debate him, but as we already had seen, they were unsuccessful. And so as a result, false charges had been brought against him. And as a result of that, he was executed. So the execution of Stephen is what opened up the floodgates of persecution against the church. And that's what's being re uh, referred to in chapter 11, verse 19, when it says, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen. So that's what had taken place. His execution opened the floodgates of persecution. And I want you to notice that persecution arose over the preaching of the gospel. Now, it was directed towards Christians, but in fact, persecution is simply revealing a hatred for Christ. In Luke 21, verse 17, Jesus said, you will be hated, but he went on to say, by all for my name's sake. So this persecution is not simply against the people who are followers of Christ, but it's really a hatred for Jesus himself. Now remember, Jesus commanded his followers to share the gospel with everybody, and that's because the message of salvation is uh, for all and is centered on him. And the gospel's intended to reach both Jew as well as the Gentile. It's not a message only for the Jews or those who lived in the Middle East. It's a, it's a message for the world. And so in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he had said, Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So when persecution arose, the believers became more intent on preaching. Now at first, as we've seen, they only spoke to Jews. But the doors were being opened to others. They evangelized the Samaritans. Then they shared with the Gentiles. And the Bible tells us in verse 21 here in chapter 11, the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And so God is moving through them. There are many people still coming to faith in Christ. The persecution had been intended to crush them but it actually had worked for their good. Psalm 76.10 says, Even human wrath will praise you. So the people left. They left Jerusalem. They went into the world. God was moving. And that brings us to our part of the study. Notice in verse 22, Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. After persecution had erupted, many had left Jerusalem. They were scattered throughout the regions of Judea, which was in the south, Samaria, which is in the center. And they went everywhere, according to Acts 8, verse 4, and they went everywhere preaching the word. Some Samaritans had received the word of God, and even Gentiles had. And even the great enemy of the church, a man by the name of Saul, had been saved. So, verse 22, news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. The leaders were aware of what was happening, and they were blessed to hear these things. And they wanted an accurate understanding, so they sent a representative. They sent a man by the name of Barnabas. Now, we've already been introduced to Barnabas. Acts 4, 36 and 37 tells us that he had sold land and donated the money to the church on behalf of those who were in need. When Saul had been saved, the disciples in Jerusalem wanted nothing to do with him. And in Acts 9, at verse 27, it says that Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he, speaking of Saul, declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so we've been introduced to this man, Barnabas. His name means son of encouragement. It was wise for them to send such a man to investigate what was happening he was also a Hellenist. It made him a great choice for that kind of task. And so it says in verse 22, they sent Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. So to get a picture of what's taking place, that reveals that he's on his way going to Antioch. He's ministering to other churches along the way. When you see the name Antioch being mentioned, it was the capital of Syria. It was 300 miles north of the city of Jerusalem. It was part of the great uh, Greek empire. It was founded by Alexander. It was the third largest city next to Rome and Alexandria. Antioch was well known for its commerce. It was well known for its culture, but it was also well known for its immorality. The people worshipped a goddess named Artemis and Apollo. 
as well as the Syrian worship of Astarte and her cult of ritual prostitutes. It was a very debased city, but it was also the home of a man by the name of Nicholas, who was one of the first seven deacons. Men from Cyprus and Cyrene had preached in Antioch. Many had believed. So the church sent Barnabas to investigate how everything's going. Now remember, Barnabas was a Hellenist. He was from Cyprus. He was a good pick. And so what happens? Well, notice it says in verse 23, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. He saw the grace of God. He saw how people responded to God's grace. He saw how people were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And as he saw this, he rejoiced because people were being saved. You won't, very often you won't know what the grace of God is if you haven't experienced the grace of God yourself. It's one of those things that you rejoice in because you've experienced it. It's one of those things that causes you to have a joy when you see other people get saved because you yourself have been saved. And people who have not experienced the grace of God don't understand why you would rejoice when somebody gets saved. People who have never been saved, if they come to a church like this and there's an invitation that's given and people come forward and these people who aren't saved will hear you clapping uh, and, and happy to see that. They don't understand why you rejoice. They don't understand what's the big deal. That person's walking forward. They don't understand that. They don't understand how, how that person had been as, as, uh, in, in sin and been in bondage. And they don't understand the, the joy that happens in, in the heart of the person who witnesses it, let alone the person who's being saved. And to try and explain that to somebody is very difficult. It, it's like if I were trying to explain to someone who has been born blind what the color blue is. How can I explain that? They have never seen it, therefore they don't know it, and there's nothing I can, I can say to liken it. Or if I say to somebody who hasn't got the sense of smell how beautiful a rose may smell, they don't have an understanding of that. There's nothing I can say because those are things that you have to have experience in. Uh, the beauty of a song, if somebody can't hear how can you explain the beauty of the voice? Or it, it just doesn't happen. There are so many things that you have to experience to understand. The taste of a strawberry. So when somebody hasn't tasted of the grace of God, they don't understand it. But, but he had. And when he saw these people are getting saved, it caused him to rejoice. He was glad, the scripture says, he had seen the grace of God and he was glad about it. I received um, a message this week that I, I asked if it would be possible if I might share it because it blessed my heart so much. I'm not going to share the whole message with you, but I'm trying to illustrate to rejoice at the grace of God and what that means. And so I'm reading a portion of something I, I printed out so you can hear and understand what I mean by rejoicing at that. Uh, good morning. I wanted to share with you what happened 20 years ago in November. On November 30th, in uh, 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 03, a 19-year-old me walked into your church alone. I tried meth that March and was immediately hooked. I did that evil drug every single day for eight months with multiple attempts to quit. After failing every time, losing a ton of weight, passing out from overdosing multiple times, being told by a doctor I was going to die if I didn't stop, it happened. I was driving one night. I saw a sign that said 107.9. I was curious, so I checked it out. I heard a sermon about vessels of honor and dishonor. It was 3 a.m. I'd been drinking and getting high all night. Having accepted that that is how I was going to die, and I knew I couldn't quit, I just partied. The doctor told me it would be impossible to quit on my own, that I would seizure up and go into cardiac arrest. And I heard the pastor talk about having to be smashed, put in a fire to become pliable. I instantly felt a warm honey or wax-like substance ooze from my head to my fingertips and toes. I was instantly sober. A few hours later, I drove to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. I'd been invited there in the past by friends. You see, I was raised in darkness. All my family members are either addicts, alcoholics, or both. I was born of a 16-year-old girl who liked to party with the musician rock and roller dad. I lived everywhere and... and uh, 
I was exposed to everything. I started drinking and getting high in the sixth grade. It was the only life I knew. I listened as you spoke. I was sure someone called you. She said, I cried so hard. She said, people were rubbing, strangers were rubbing my back and bringing me tissue. I was struggling to breathe and walk, but I walked up to the invitation and I got on my knees. I gave my life to Jesus that day. He changed my life. I knew God loved me. Because I prayed that day for my withdrawals to be horrible, so I'd never go back to the drug. But he took away my addiction. I didn't feel a thing. No shakes, no sweat, no temptation or desire to return to that drug or any other for, for that matter. I had to get high multiple times a day. I wasn't able to go a few hours without a hit. I'm so blessed to have experienced such a miracle. I attended your church for years. I had to stop because I moved. She says, I, I now have three God-loving children who all know of you. I occasionally listen to your podcast. Thank you, Pastor. I'm eternally grateful. He rejoiced. The words that she closed with that I got too choked up to say, she said, I'm eternally grateful. Eternally grateful. My life has been changed. That's why we clap. That's why we rejoice. And that's why he did. He went there. He saw that God was moving. And it says, and he came and had seen the grace of God. See, that's why people will clap. That's why people get excited. That's why, why, why we, we do that. We rejoice. Why? Because we know God's grace. We know what it's like to be lost. We know what it's like to wake up in, in a pool of our own vomit. At least I do. We know what it's like to be so lost that you don't have any clue as what's going to happen in your life. And then when God saves that person, then people like us, we who have been there, we who understand His grace, we see it and it causes us great joy. And that's what's taking place with Him. He sees it and He's rejoicing. And seeing this faith in Christ had blessed Him Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 4, he said it like this. He said, I always thank my God for you because of the grace he has given you in Christ Jesus. And so he saw how God's grace had, had brought them to salvation, and he encouraged them with, with purpose of heart. Notice, he said that they should continue with the Lord. The word continue means to abide or remain in place. It means to persevere, to stick it out. Barnabas knew that the grace of God made salvation possible, but he also knew that man's will can frustrate the grace and work that God intends to do in us. We can know what God wants us to do and frustrate his work by resisting his spirit. And there are temptations that can come our way that draw our enticements to try and draw us back to the life that we've been saved from. And he knew this, and so he encouraged them. He, he encouraged them to be resolute. He encouraged them to be disciplined in the pursuit of the Lord. And he knew that to grow and mature would require them to discipline themselves in Jesus Christ. It would require that they abide in him, that they might grow in him. In 2 Peter 3, 18, it says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever." Amen. So as we grow in our understanding of His grace, we grow in our knowing of who He is. God has saved them. And knowing this inspired them to walk properly, to walk worthy of the gospel. Again, Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act on behalf of his good purpose. He didn't say continue to work for, he said work out your salvation because God is working in you. So we need to know that the one who is within us gives us the power to be pleasing to him. So the Christian life is one of the spiritual, uh, built on uh, spiritual discipline. It's built on knowing the Lord. It's, it's a daily thing. It's not a weekly or or couple times a week. It's a daily thing. Like Jesus in Luke 9, 23 said, he said, 
Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. So this kind of awareness was part of their concern for believers to grow. Again, in Acts 13, 43, it says, When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. How am I going to continue in the grace of God? Well, one of the ways is being faithful to what His Word teaches because it's through His Word that we're fed. It's by His Word that we're equipped and His Spirit working within us, empowering us to do these things. It's, it's our love for Him. And it's our love for His Word that reveals that we actually know Him. It's like what John 8, 31 and 32 says when Jesus said, If you abide in my Word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. The truth will make you free. So Barnabas was concerned that these new believers would grow in their faith. He's a good man. He's filled with the Spirit and faith. And that's why he exhorts them to resolutely continue in their following of the Lord Jesus Christ. Learning God's Word and growing in His grace strengthens them. The Bible teaches us in 1 Peter 2, verses 2 and 3, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that... By it, you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Every mama in this room knows that if you were a nursing mom, that if your baby that you were nursing was not thirsty, was not hungry, there was probably something wrong. Either the baby was full or the baby was ill. And when a believer is not hungry for the Word of God, that's a spiritual check for themselves. If you're not hungry for God's Word, there may be something wrong with your walk. Because even as babies desire mama's milk, a believer should desire the Word of God. Why? So that we may grow up in Christ. Now, persecution was growing against believers. They were going to suffer for their faith. They were going to suffer, but they must remain true to the Lord. They must cleave to him they must remain with him they must continue with him now again it mentions in verse 24 he was a good man full of the holy spirit and faith when it says he was a good man that speaks of his character that speaks of his morals and that's what defines a person as good he was filled with the spirit he was filled with faith and it was under his moral and faith-filled ministry that many came to to know the lord jesus christ again those are qualities of a true minister of the gospel. He's good in morals and he's filled with the power of the Spirit. So God uses Barnabas and in his ministry, many came to faith. There were so many coming to faith in Christ that he needed help in the ministry. And so verse 25 says, Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek out Saul. Now they knew each other. They were friends. When Saul first tried to join the disciples in Jerusalem, remember he was rejected. It was Barnabas who vouched for him. In Acts 9, 26 and 27, it says when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He, to, he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that, that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. And so Barnabas knew that this would be a good man to be of help in ministry. You see, they accepted him in their fellowship. He ministered there. He began preaching the gospel to Hellenists and they tried to kill him. So in Acts 9.30, it says, When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. So Saul's been in Tarsus, where he had lived before, and most likely he has heard news of what's going on. And since Saul had ministered to Hellenists, it would be good for him because he was qualified to minister to these people. And so verse 26 again says, They found him and brought him to Antioch. So Barnabas wanted Saul to work alongside of him in the ministry there in Antioch. He was a Hebrew scholar. He was fluent in Greek. He was acquainted with Gentile culture. He would be a great asset in discipling and, and winning converts. The work was too big for Barnabas alone. Many people were getting saved. In ministry, you always need to have people who can work alongside of you. If the Lord is doing a work, it's good to be able to divide the work up into the hands of others. 
Because you want people to be equipped for works of service, so you train up and minister alongside of, because there are so many people, it's difficult sometimes for one person to handle everything. And that's a fact. I mean, that's ministry itself. You see it here in the case of, of, of Barnabas and his ministry. He needs to have Saul come alongside of him. This man was well qualified to help him uh, in, in every way, shape, and form. And we've seen that to be true even in our fellowship where, where I can't do everything. And I don't think that the senior pastor is supposed to. No, we, we, we look at the scriptures uh, where Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 tells us he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers uh, for the quickening of the saints for the work of ministry. So we're to work together. Many hands make work light. You need to have people who are out there doing the work of ministry. When Jesus um, selected people, he didn't just select one person to be his chief follower. He, he selected the 12, and from there they, they grew into having deacons, and they went on to have elders and all of that because there needed to be a number of people working together, and that's what's happening here. There's a pouring into and there's a using for the things of the Lord. And, and the work was just too big for Barnabas to, to do this alone. And therefore, he, he asked for help. Now, it says in verse 26 that when Saul arrived for a year, they assembled with the church and notice, and they taught many people. So once again, the Lord is moving. Many are being saved. Earlier, it was noted that many in Antioch had come to the Lord and and this is what brought Barnabas to Antioch in the first place. Now working alongside of Paul, even more are coming to faith in Christ. Now Barnabas had encouraged believers to continue with the Lord, and his desire for them was to grow. It was so great that he remained there for a year. And again, it's good to minister with more than one person. Now I want you to see something in verse 26, and I'll take a moment to develop this, because it's something that you could pass up and not notice. It says that the last portion of verse 26, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. I want to develop that for a minute. You may find this interesting. At least I did. If you don't, well, I do. Why is that? Well, when you read, we'll say in the book of Acts, when you begin in chapter 1, and you travel through the book of Acts, and those of you who've been traveling with us, and those of you who've read the book of Acts, you'll notice this, that when... When followers of Christ are mentioned, they're called different, by different names. They're called disciples, or it'll speak of the brothers, or it speaks of the, the saints. It, it speaks of the church, or, or followers of the way. Those are the way believers were spoken of in the first several chapters of Acts. But now you have, in verse 26, in chapter 11, a simple phrase, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Antioch was a city that was known for inventing nicknames. Some of us understand that. We, ra we were raised in families that give you nicknames. I had a friend. His name was Leeper. I don't even remember his first name. It was Leaper. Why was he called Leaper? One of my friends said, do you know why we call him Leaper? I said, no, I never really thought about that. Well, he said, we were at the beach, and there was a fire pit, and there had been a fire in it, and there were some metal bars in it, and he tried to leap over it. He says, have you ever looked at his leg? He has a big old burn mark. He said he didn't make it. So we called him Leaper. I don't know about you. You know, a lot of families, my family, my uncles, all of them had nicknames. My Uncle Weddle. I can't give you the rest of the nicknames. But they always are something they've done or are known for. My dad... My dad had a nickname. His is a good one. Panchito. Pancho. His mama never even called him his name. His name was Francisco. Why was he called Pancho? Because he was born January 29th, which was St. Francis observation. And so Mexicans from Mexico, and even to this day, 
would give their son the name Francisco. My dad's name was Frank. But his family all called him Pancho. And that's how I knew him. Pancho Juarez in Montebello. He said, I know why your dad's name is Pancho. I said, why is that? He said, he was born January 29th, wasn't he? I said, yeah, how'd you know that? He said, because that's why my nickname is Pancho. And he's the one who explained that to me. I said, I didn't know that. So I, I don't know how many of you, I look around here, I think many of you probably are familiar with nicknames. You know, they, they, they have a girl, hey, sad girl. <laughs> or they have this guy, hey, there's little savage. Little savage is like five foot two. They, <laughs> but they all have nicknames. Been, I had, my, my uncles all had nicknames. A lot of us do. All of my kids have nicknames. So I understand this. I understand this, and many of us, I'm sure, do. They were known as a city that invented nicknames. That's why they were first, and I want to develop this with you. That's just a little introduction to why that's an important thing to even bring up. Believers in Christ were called Christianus. Christianus. That, the word Christianus means belonging to or in possession of Christ. That's what it means. Belonging to or owned by Jesus Christ. Now, why is that important? Because it was a, an insult. It's interesting to note that one commentator pointed out that the disciples didn't use the word of themselves. We do. When somebody says, what is your religious faith? We'll say, I'm a Christian. But the disciples did not refer to themselves that way. It was an insult. Why is that? Because in a world that valued being free, the Christians said that they were bought at a price. And Christians referred to themselves as servants of Jesus. Now, here's something you might find interesting. In the versions of Scripture, the translations that we have, when it speaks of being a servant of Christ, and the word servant in your Scripture, it'll say servant. Very often, that word servant is a softer word than what it actually means, because what the word servant actually means is a slave. And during the time of the writing of the Scripture, it was valued to be free, and it was derogatory to be called a slave because that meant you were owned by somebody. And so the Greeks looking down on the Christians because you guys are slaves and that's how they thought. You guys are slaves. It was not used as like, oh, there are the Christians. It was, there's a Christian. He's a slave, she's a slave. They're owned by somebody else, and it was actually derogatory. And that is why we actually accept the name Christian. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies and your spirit, which belong to God. We were in the marketplace of sin. This is New Testament theology. We were in the marketplace of sin. We were slaves to sin in the marketplace of sin. And in the, in the ancient cities, they would have marketplaces where they sold slaves. And people would come and they would bring the cost or the price of redemption. They would purchase the slave. And that slave was called redeemed. So they were redeemed from the marketplace of sin with silver or gold. But the scripture says you have been redeemed not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You have been bought out of the marketplace for you were a slave to sin. But he paid the price to set you free. And seeing that he paid that price to set you free, we are bought at a price Glorify God with your body and your spirit because he owns you. He is your Lord, and that's why you bow your knee to him. He's your Lord. That's Christianity, and people don't understand that. People don't understand that. And so they would call them Christian, 
And that was intended to be a slight, a derogatory. They were, they were putting them down for that. Oh, those are Christians. They were first called Christians in Antioch. It's humiliating to be a slave. So what happened is the early church took this name upon ourselves because we're voluntary servants of Christ. And instead of humiliating us, it liberated us from being the slave of sin. And that's why in 1 Peter 4, verse 16, this is what Peter said. He said, if you suffer as a Christian, what is that? He's speaking of the persecution that comes because we are identified as slaves. If you suffer as a Christian, he said, don't be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. So we took those words, that word, which was a, a slur, and we owned it. That's who we are. Why? Because we're not so proud as to say that we belong to ourselves. None of us belongs to himself. Either you're a slave of sin, the enemy, or you're a slave of Jesus. But you are a slave. Even as that Jewish prophet Bob Dylan said, you've got to serve somebody. <laughs> and people do. Either you serve your flesh and the devil, or you serve the one who saved you, Jesus Christ. And so they were first called Christians, he says, in Antioch. That will give you some insight next time somebody asks you, are you a Christian? In verse 27, he goes on to say this, in, in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agba, stood up. And showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea, and this they also did. They sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And so moving on in the chapter... Notice it says in verse 27, in those days there were prophets and they came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Prophets were used in the church primarily to preach as well as predicting future events. Remember with me that the apostles were the building blocks. They were the transmitters of the word of God or God's will to man. But the prophets would confirm the word that was being preached and they also would reveal on occasion things to come. And here we see a man by the name of Agabus. Agabus will be mentioned again in chapter 21. And Agabus predicted a widespread famine. And that famine came to pass in uh, 41 to 54 AD. And it speaks concerning a famine throughout the world. Uh, that speaking of the known world to them at that time, they would use the, the term the world in reference to the Roman Empire. So there was a famine that, struck, that uh, went throughout the Roman Empire. And so what did they do? Well, verse 29, the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. So what did they do? They met an urgent need. That is something that the church has done almost from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, from the beginning. That is something that the church has done. When there's been a need, the church has gathered together to, to meet that need. In Acts 4, 34 and 35, it says there were no needy persons among them for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and, and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. So that's what they did. They, they would meet the needs and, and they would reach out to help. And, and uh, that is something that we just spoke about today, how we had a team that went out, 20 people went out, to, to help those in, in Maui who had been uh, suffering through the fire. And we have another team going out that will be doing the same. We, they go out and they help, and that's what the church has always done. The church is very generous. The body of Christ, not just this fellowship here, but the body of Christ historically is very, very generous. You may find this interesting. There have been books written about this. Maybe you're aware of it yourself. But there are those who have actually said... Um, are Christians more generous than the average person who doesn't profess faith in Christ? And so there have been books and studies done, and I'll give you one real brief uh, uh, excerpt, and that was this, that, that uh, somebody wanted to know, so what they did is they went to two cities that were of the same basic population size. One city was San Francisco, and the other was a conservative city in a Midwestern town. Similar population. And what they did is they actually 
uh, see who was giving to those who were standing there on street corners with the Salvation Army. And then they asked for the revenue that had been brought in in San Francisco. And then, then they compared it with the, uh, the revenue that came in from this conservative city. And the revenue that came from the conservatives was greatly more than that that came in San Francisco. And so they asked the question, why is that? And the answer was simple. And you'll all understand this. The people in San Francisco were saying, well, we pay taxes, and taxes go to help people. So they're already taking money from us so they can help people. That's what our taxes do. But when they asked the Christians, the Christians, they said, don't you pay taxes? They said, yeah, but that's not charity. That's taxes. Charity comes from a heart to care for somebody else. The, the church is known for that, and the world is not. And when things occurred, the church would see, and the church would, would get together and when help, when all the way back in when the tsunami hit in in uh, in Thailand in the, that region, we went out and ministered out in uh, in Phuket, Thailand, and I, I never received an offering, but I said to our fellowship at that time, I said, if you want to help, just mark something for the tsunami. We get we give every dime. We don't keep any. We give it. We received in one offering over a quarter million dollars. Amen. Yeah, because the church is generous. Because the church sees things and says, how can we help? That's what the body of Christ has always done. That's what it does. We don't sit on our wallets. We open them for those in need. And that's what was taking place during that time. They heard that there were things going on. There was persecution. There was famine. There were so many things. And so that became a pattern you see, Gentile believers were taught to be concerned about their Jewish brethren. Romans 15, uh, verses 25 through 27. However, I am on my way to Jerusalem to serve the saints. Uh, saints, therefore, Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor saints, poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual blessings they are obligated to minister to them with material blessings. So the church has always done that, and that's what's taking place. And so what did they do? Verse 30, this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Why Barnabas and Saul? Well, they were trustworthy. Somebody said the character and labors of these men had marked them out as the most fit to be the bearers of this help. And it was from Jerusalem that Barnabas had been sent at first to Antioch. And so the aid was sent and was carried by those trusted to carry such sums of money. Because the draw of materialism is so great, they needed trusted men to carry the finances. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say the love, it doesn't say that money is the root. There's, that's one of the scriptures that is, is so misquoted so often. Oh, you Christians, you know, money, you say money is, no. The scripture says the love of money. You have to actually teach people to be generous. You have to. We have to be taught. Even as Christ gave, we give. You have to be taught. Paul tells that to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 in various places. Teach them to meet urgent needs. Teach them not to be caught up with finances. Why is that? Because it can cloud your vision of eternity. So we have to be taught to, to be generous. It's something that isn't natural to us. I know there are people who say, oh, no, no, uh, you don't have to be taught. We are naturally generous. And, and anybody who says that is somebody who's never raised a kid. It's the bottom line. Because everybody here who's ever been with a three-year-old knows this. If you've got a three-year-old and they have a pile of toys and they're playing with this one or playing with that one and another three-year-old comes to visit, walks into the playroom and picks up a toy, what does that three-year-old who's playing already normally do? They throw down the one they're holding to grab the one that other kid just took because all of those toys are mine and you can't have any of them. Now, I know some of you raised, you know, little Jesuses, but most of us, <laughs> most of us, most of us had normal kids who inherited their mother 
disposition to sin. It's in our heart. You say, well, you outgrow that, really. You outgrow that? No. The first time you told a lie, you probably got caught, right? Most of us did. But you can polish your lying abilities. You can. You just learn how to, and then you can, you can become president. You can learn how to lie, okay? That's the only statement I'm making. I just make a quick. You, you can look, Don't get mad at me. Anyway, you can polish it. You can learn to steal. You learn to lie. But, but you, you outgrow that. No, sin is never outgrown. And self-centeredness is, is never outgrown. It's died to. Well, I'm not self-centered. Pastor, I've been a Christian a long time, really. If I took a picture of you and four people, who's the first person you're going to look at in the picture? Why? <laughs> because, oh, look at me, my eyes closed. Oh, I'm, you know. Did you notice those are three other people? No, I hadn't noticed it. I'm too busy. <laughs> That's just human nature. Am I putting it down? No, I'm just disclosing it. It's true. It's just true, isn't it? It's true. So what you need is you need to die to yourself. That takes teaching and discipline on your part and my part, our part, to die to self. Because I already live to myself. I already want to do. So I have to learn. So when it comes to carrying money, you don't just hand great sums of money to anybody. You hand it to the one you trust. And so that's what they did here. They handed it to Barnabas and Saul. They handed it because they could trust them because they knew that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And Paul went on to say, some people eager for money wandered away from the faith, pierced themselves with many griefs. He was a man of character. We've already seen that uh, Barnabas was. We've already seen he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. We also now see that Saul is too. A man who's filled with the Holy Ghost and faith and trustworthy to take this with the right purpose. And so that should be a goal for every one of us is that we might die to the draw of materialism so that we can become trusted with the things of God.